Every three months, American financial research firm Morningstar releases a comprehensive report on KiwiSaver. You guys enjoyed the last video I made looking at this report, so I'll make this a quarterly feature moving forwards. By the end of this video, you'll hopefully know more about the KiwiSaver scheme, the factors impacting returns over the past quarter, and most importantly, what funds are the top performing. Choosing the wrong fund can literally cost you thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars over a working career. This video will help you understand how your KiwiSaver fund is performing relative to other options in the market. I post a lot of content in the personal finance, investing, and first home buying space, both here in New Zealand and in Australia. So make sure to subscribe down below to see my other content. Let's get into it. First things first, how has the KiwiSaver scheme changed over the past quarter? In total, Kiwis have over $110 billion invested in KiwiSaver. This increased about $3.5 billion between April and June this year. It is said that roughly 3.25 million Kiwis are in KiwiSaver. This puts the average KiwiSaver balance at around $33,800. This obviously is not enough to retire on. At the lower end of the scale, weighing down these results will be students yet to enter the workforce, or those below 40 that may have withdrawn the bulk of their investment in order to purchase their first home. At the other end of the scale, many workers will have joined later in their careers as KiwiSaver was only launched in 2007. As KiwiSaver matures, it would be fair to expect the average balance to grow substantially, weighted towards those that had been in the scheme for a longer period of time. There are currently 21 KiwiSaver providers and 296 KiwiSaver funds that you can choose from. The largest of those remain unchanged from the last quarter. ANZ is the largest provider with over $20 billion under management, with roughly $1 out of every $5 in KiwiSaver going through them. ASB and Fisher Funds are tied for second, each managing over $16 billion, with market shares exceeding 15%. Other popular options include Westpac at fourth, Milford Asset Management at fifth, Generate eighth, Booster ninth, and Simplicity in tenth. If we look between April and June, the average multi-sector fund earned between 0.3 and 0.8%, so there were modest returns for the quarter. At the lower end of the scale, growth funds earned an average return of just 0.3% for the quarter. The default options surprisingly came out on top with an average return of 0.8%. This was surprising as there were a few factors which should have benefited the riskier funds. First, the MSCI World X Australia index rose 8% in New Zealand dollar terms. Even the local NZX index rose 2.5%. Second, a weakening New Zealand dollar aided foreign investments. While New Zealand faces economic headwinds in the form of sticky inflation and a negative wealth effect from the housing sector, the US economy was up 2.6% for the quarter, which should have benefited offshore investments. So there was likely something off in the stock mix among the riskier funds. The highest earning fund for the quarter was Colonel's Global 100 New Zealand Hedged Fund, which earned a whopping 8.9% as it was sheltered from currency fluctuation. The worst performing fund was the Quarter Carbon Neutral Cryptocurrency Fund, which lost 15.3%. If we look at the highest 12-month performer, however, they came out on top so it's certainly a high-risk, high-return option. Let's now take a look at the latest quarterly returns. Starting with the default funds, coming out on top, we had the Simplicity and the Superlife default funds. They grew by 1.2% for the quarter. The only default plan to drop in value was the Fisher Fund default plan, sliding a mere 0.1%. The two best performing default funds have the lowest fund size at just over half a billion dollars a piece, and their fees are the lowest as well, below 30 basis points. Their one-year average returns blend into the pack, but what is clear here is that Fisher funds are underperforming. They have the second most money under management, the worst quarterly and annual returns by a large margin, and the second highest fees on the list for such a poor performance. If you're with Fisher Fund's default plan, or any default plan for that matter, assess whether you should move into another fund which caters to your risk and return preferences. Moving along to the conservative funds, 
BNZ First Home Buyer Fund came out on top. This fund was up 1.1% for the quarter. This has been a fairly good performer in the conservative category over recent years. They were followed by Pathfinder, up 1%, and ASB, up 0.9%. AMP and Simplicity's conservative funds closely followed. The lowest performing funds for the quarter include ANZ, which over every time period is average to poor, and Key Street Income, which has had an unusually poor year. Next up are the moderate funds, with 21 options. Out on top were Pi Funds, with their conservative fund earning a return of 1.2% for the quarter. Their returns seem to vary up and down. We're looking out towards their 1, 3 and 5 year returns. Second up is the BNZ fund, which earned a healthy 0.9%. Unlike Pi funds that we just looked at, BNZ's moderate fund is consistently in the top 3 for every time period, from 3 months all the way out to 10 years. So they are doing something right over the long run here. Third up is Superlife, and then we have ASB and Westpac's moderate funds, all above 0.8%, for the quarter. At the bottom of the list, we have ANZ, which again have been a consistent underperformer. They are joined by Invest Now, which all the way out to three years has been a poor performer in this category. Now we're up to the balanced funds, where we cross over the 50% mark for growth asset weighting. There are currently 33 funds in this category. On top were Pathfinder, which had a return of 1.9%. They've been a top five performer all the way out to three years of returns. Second up, we have Pi Fund which has had a solid year for many of their funds. Third up was Kernel, and fourth was Key Street, both consistent performers in this category since their launch. And finally, we have Simplicity's Balanced Fund, up 1.3% and also a consistent performer. Once again, ANZ is dead last, which is unfortunate as they are the largest fund providers with about $3.5 billion in this fund alone. They lost 0.9% over the last quarter for their investors, while the average in this list was a positive 0.6%. Looking out over 1, 3, 5 and 10 years, ANZ has consistently been at the bottom or very near the bottom. Other poor performers over the past quarter include InvestNow's Castle Point Fund, Fisher Funds and Summer, which is a part of Forsyth Bar. Next up are the growth funds, where over a third of all KiwiSaver funds are invested. There are 26 funds here in total. At the top of the list are Pathfinder, up 2.1%. All the way out to three years, they've been a top performer in the growth category. Continuing with the other categories, Pi funds have also outperformed up 2% for the quarter. Simplicity is another top performer in the third slot over the past quarter but have been top five all the way out to five years. Key Street is another consistent performer in fourth spot this quarter. Up until now, they've been a consistent top three performer all the way out to their 10-year returns, which is a crazy track record. BNZ slots into the fifth place position, the highest among the big banks. The lowest performer, once again, is ANZ's growth fund, with the balanced growth fund not far behind. These two funds have over $8 billion invested in them, among the largest funds on the market. They are 23rd and 26th from 26 funds over three months. Over one year, the last two placed funds. Over three years, 19th and 21st from 24 funds. Over five years, 14th and 17th from 24 funds. And 10 years, 8th and 12th from 13 funds. If you've got your KiwiSaver with ANZ, I'm sure you're not happy to see these results. The good thing is, it's easy to change funds. Invest now, Forsyth Bar's Summer, and Fisher Funds all underperformed in the growth fund space. The largest fund here, the famed Milford Active Growth Fund, came 20th from 26 funds for the quarter. They've had a rough year, so hopefully they can see their performance pick back up soon for the benefit of their many investors. And finally, from the multi-sector funds, we have the aggressive section. These funds are the most heavily invested in growth assets. Colonel's High Growth Fund came out on top, earning 1.9% for the quarter. Important to note here is that Colonel charges the lowest fees of just 0.25%. The average for an aggressive fund is 0.99%, so they are already 74 basis points ahead of any other fund before even making an investment. Second up is Simplicity, charging the second lowest fees at 0.29%. And third was ASB's Aggressive Fund. Over their short time on the market, 
these three funds have been top three performers, Generate is another star here, consistently over 10 years being a top four performer. Booster's high growth fund has also been a top performer. At the bottom of the pile, once again, is ANZ. Whatever they did during the quarter, it backfired heavily, with the fund down 1.6%. The average was a positive 0.6%, so if you had $100,000 invested, you lost $2,200 on the back of ANZ's performance. Also down the bottom was Fisher Funds, again near the bottom, and Nico and Milford. Now we move on to our single sector funds. While those we've already covered invest in several asset classes, these all stick to one. In the cash space, Superlife NZ Cash came out on top up 2%. They were followed by Colonel's Cash Plus Fund and Nico's NZ Cash Fund. Looking over at fixed interest, Nico's New Zealand Corporate Bonds Fund was on top, earning a return of 1.1%. Generate followed with their defensive fund while Quarter trailed with their fixed interest fund. International shares is where we can see some huge variance in returns. Earning the gold, silver and bronze medals here was Colonel. On top was their Global 100 Hedged Fund, followed by their Unhedged Global 100 Fund and the ESG hedged fund. These investments have ridden the highs of the dominant US stock market and Colonel's low fees of just 0.25% set them apart from the pack. At the bottom of the list is Nico's Arc Disruptive Fund, down over 10%, and Colonel's Clean Energy Fund, down 6.8%. You can also invest in property funds through KiwiSaver. They all underperformed for the quarter, all down into negative returns. One answer's International Property Fund slipped just 0.1%, while the summer listed property fund slid 8.7%. Looking at Australasian shares, Superlife's Australasian Financials Fund grew by 2.5%. At the other end of the scale, Quarter's New Zealand Property Fund slid 12.6%. And finally, under miscellaneous, we can find some of the most exotic options under KiwiSaver. At the top, and much like Colonel's top performing funds, Superlife's US Large Growth Fund, which invests in the SmartShares USG Index, grew by 7.5%. At the bottom of the list was Quarter's Cryptocurrency Fund, down over 15% for the quarter. Investors in this fund aren't probably concerned by the short-term returns, however. They're backing the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum to grow over the next decades, as it has done in the past one. So that wraps up the last quarter in KiwiSaver. This slide here from Morningstar is an interesting one, as it shows the estimated annual fee revenue for each provider. ANZ and Fisher Funds, for example, banked an estimated $170 and $160 million for some of the worst returns in the analysis. Colonel, on the other hand, earned just half a million dollars, while Pathfinder and Pi Funds, which did really well for the quarter, managed to do it with just $4 million in fees apiece. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to keep up to date with mortgage and saving rates in New Zealand, make sure to sign up down below to my Substack. I post weekly what's happening in the mortgage market and the fixed interest market, so you can keep on top of your investments and your mortgage. Make sure to also subscribe down below to see all of my future content in the personal finance and investing space. Thanks for watching and I look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.